Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hit and Hustle from IrishSportsDaily.com. I am your host, Greg Flamong, and with me, as always, is Jamie Uyama, Mr. Jamie University. It is Thursday, March 14th, and we have a mailbag show for everyone today. Got some questions from the IrishSportsDaily.com subscribers, uh, and they gave us some good ones. So we're going to we're gonna go through those questions, talk about all things uh, pertaining to Notre Dame football, uh some spring ball, some kind of looking forward, some kind of fun questions as well. And then like an NFL draft question with quarterbacks, Jamie. So I'm interested to get your thoughts on that. And uh, that's going to be pretty much what the show is today. So um, thank you everyone for tuning in. If this is your first time catching us, please hit the like, please hit subscribe, please hit the notification bell. So you know, whatever it is, we are going live links to the podcast are going to be in the description below so you can check us out there you can check out dimes with dara on that link uh as well we got a question about dimes with dara uh so we'll talk about that so you can catch that podcast on that feed as well and before we get going want to thank one of our sponsors as always we're going to start off with esqclothing.com which is founded by notre dame alum ga wang you've seen esq and all your favorite notre dame players and coaches with over a decade of making the best custom clothing available ESQ will help you look and feel your best in 2024 from a perfect fitting suit or sport coat, shirt, or bomber jacket, or the perfect tuxedo for a wedding season. Check out Gaz's amazing work at esqclothing.com. Book an appointment to upgrade your wardrobe today. Mention ISD and get 10% off your entire purchase. Jamie, uh, it's Thursday, so that means... Six Thoughts on a Thursday came out today. What did you write about for the people? What can they check out on irishsportsdaily.com? Uh, well, I wrote about Joe Alt. Um, you know, one of the He's things good. is that he, he, he is. He's not bad. Not not a bad uh, offensive tackle. You know, OT1 in the NFL draft consensus right now. Um, yeah. You know, it's going to be a top 10 pick. Uh, you know, I, I got a chance to talk to uh, Matt Bowen, who was – uh, from ESPN, who I talked to uh, earlier in the week where I did a piece on uh, Dom Hulak. Uh, Matt also coaches at uh, IC Catholic in um, Illinois. And uh, so he, you know, very familiar with, with Dom, but, you know, he also has this great insight on the NFL because he, you know, works on NFL, has worked on NFL matchup. He did rights on ESPN.com about free agency and the draft and, you know, he has studied Joe Alt, so I got some thoughts from him uh, on Alt. And, you know, basically he said everything you kind of expected to say uh, about Alt in terms of, like, he has all the pieces there to be, uh, you know, a top five pick and be one of the best, uh, you know, tackles um, in pass pro in, in in the nfl because he can do all these things and handle all these different rushers right and um so i wrote about kind of like how alt sky consistency which is pretty amazing just like his level where you know i i the thing that stood stood out to me about alt uh and it was the same thing that stood out to me about um you know ronnie stanley and and zach martin is that you never remember or you remember when they got beat because they never got beat. Yeah. So it was like, oh my gosh, like, wow, that guy got Stanley. Like Shaq mm-hmm. Lawson, I remember he did the spin move on Stanley. Stanley had to grab him and, you know, <laughs> from get him from killing Sean Kaiser. And right. you're like, wow, he like, he he held on that play. I was like, you never saw that happen with Ronnie Stanley because he never got beat. He never got beat. And it was the same with all, like, you know, I, you know, in in the bowl game, you know, Jordan Birch got him one time, right, on, on a speed to power, and then another time, Mason Rager, uh, who was a guy that I didn't even really know before that uh, Louisville game, you know, he he put Alt on his butt. I mean, he, he mentioned it in in um, his interviews at the combine. He might have tripped a little bit when we got caught up with Pat Coogan's feet, but like it was noticeable because that never happened. So, right. and it just showed like that kind of level of consistency. And I kind of let it into because they need to have that, you know, it would be nice to have that level of consistency because they're going to play some pretty good edge rushers this year. And yeah. the one thing about Texas A&M and they got, they got some, it, it's funny because last year Notre Dame played a, a, some really, really good defensive tackles and they just didn't have their guards couldn't match up 
they couldn't match up. They lost in, in those matchups. And this year, they're not playing nearly the same level of, of interior guys, but the edge guys are really good. Like Florida State's got some dudes, unsurprisingly. You know, even with Jared Verscon, they got some dudes. Texas A&M has like four guys that, you know, maybe not one of them's a first round pick, but like they're all like good, good players, like very good rushers, like guys that mm. you're not, uh, you know, if you don't have a Joe Alt, you, you're you going to feel a little bit less confident. So, and that's game one. So, uh, Charles Jogasad, like, it's like you're going to walk right into there. And whether it's Tosh Baker or Emil Wagner or whether you're taking a transfer or something after spring or whatever, like, whoever it is, it's like, you know, welcome. Like, it's going to be – that's going to be hard. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's just, like, something that they got to deal with this year. Um, yeah, that and then uh, the talk about the receivers and, like, man, it's always amazing to me because everyone's had such high expectations for receivers. And, and, and the media, and we, you know, we talked about it uh, last podcast, Greg, where, you know, the, with Micah Gilbert and mm -hmm. day and all that. And, you know, there's just been so many guys that um, the only guy that I really can remember uh, since I've been covering the team that has been like, wow, like dominant in practice, like pretty much every day we saw him was Kevin Stefferson. And you mean freshman freshman. Yes. Yeah. Freshman. Okay. Because obviously, like Claypool and whatever, and boy, yeah, yeah, these yeah. guys had these times. But as a freshman, no one else has been as good as as uh, Stefferson. Just day in, day out, you're like, man, they can't cover him. Like it's just a thing. So, and even Stefferson had like, a, I mean, he's other factors that went into it. But he had a decent year, but he wasn't like he tore it up or anything like that. What it's do you just, have? Twenty nine catches, four hundred something yards, something yeah. like that. And I mean, and then he, you know, he beat like. Uh, he had that one double move in the um, USC the game, USC game Sonora, that yeah. really, stood, yeah, which was like stood out. And he's was a could have been a great player, right? He could could have been a great player, but you look at all of those um, guys at Notre Dame over the years, and there hasn't been another Michael Floyd, right? There hasn't been another Michael Floyd, a guy who puts like you know forty something catches, seven hundred, almost eight hundred yards, right? Like there just hasn't been that guy, and but that's everywhere. That's yeah. everywhere. Like you look at, so Roma Dunze, Marvin Harrison Jr. And uh, Malik neighbors, like none of those guys put up numbers. As far as they're the top three of the, of Danny Jeremiah's top four in the NFL draft. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, and none of those guys put up numbers. Neighbors had 28 catches. The other guys had, had, uh, you know, f four and, uh, and nine, like it's just, or 11, sorry. Um, but, they just it's it's so hard to really get there but i mean all those guys took major jumps as sophomores but it's just it doesn't happen right away like all the guys who are five stars zachariah branch had 31 catches you know and i wouldn't say he was a star right away he was more of a special teams impact guy and a lot of his catches were you know jets sweep stuff like right you know, yeah uh screen game you know, he wasn't like a he, he wasn't like Jordan Addison as a receiver. Well, the rest of the five stars, there's five other five stars. Those guys combined for 20 catches, like five, five, five stars combined for 20 catches. Mm -hmm. Like these are the guys are who are supposed to be the best guys. And it's just it just doesn't happen. So it's like if you're looking for immediate help from a freshman, it's just it's probably not going to come ever. And that's just the reality of it. I mean. There's a difference between I think there's a distinction to be made between immediate help and immediate like dominance, you know? Yeah. Like, like major so, impact. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like like Floyd, you know, uh CFB Hertz makes the point in the chat. Hopefully we'll get enough awesomeness out of the older receivers that we don't need a freshman to have a Michael Floyd season. Yeah, like I think that's yeah. the like Michael Floyd is kind of special, right? Like he's a special, um, a special example and a special, you know thing that came through the program there um i don't think notre dame needs that this year but like you know something like the chris brown thing where everyone remembers the one catch but they tried to go to him a number of times so he could have had a number of impact plays in the 2012 season not just the one big play against oklahoma but then again it won you a game right it, it kind of did so uh that's that sort of thing is uh is um you know important 
Uh, so thank you. For, we got a bunch of people in the chat. Rajon is not here, but he gave a thumbs up, and uh, he'll listen later. Rajon is in every appreciate show. Appreciate it, Rajon. Yeah, Rajon's the man. So uh, we appreciate his contributions all the time. Uh, I, there's stir fry here. Uh, do you plan for the O line to bring us to victory? Um, we'll talk about that. But stir, I I don't re- recall this uh, username being in the in the chat before. So thank yeah. you. If you're a first-time commenter, long-time uh, viewer, or whatever it may be, thank you for participating in the show. All right, let's get to the questions because the first one uh, is about what we're, we're always talking about monitoring things and things we're keeping an eye on. Can we get a recap on all the things that Greg is monitoring? Jamie's doing some monitoring as well. Uh, and one of those things, I think, is uh, – and it's been brought up in the chat. Michael Maloney brought, uh, brought up Emil Wagner and his weight. We're monitoring – the Emil Wagner weight situation, right? We've, we've got some conflicting uh, evidence as far as, you know, they, they put down on the, uh, on the official sheet, he weighs 281. And here's the other thing about that, right? Like we talk about, Oh, you know, it's, it's wrong or whatever. Sometimes Notre Dame weights are wrong and that's true, but like they, they have no, why would they undersell it? You know, like there's no reason for There's like, no if, reason to undersell it. They would love for him to be 295 and they would absolutely put it down on the, on the form. Right. So I, it's like, it, there's nothing like nefarious about it, it, but if he weighed in at what he weighed in, like, I don't know, you could weigh him in another time. It, there's also the fact that like, you look at him, he looks bigger, right? He doesn't look like, Oh wow. He's small. Like you mentioned on power hour, you mentioned uh, Carmody, Michael Carmody, like, he does. Look, he looked thin, right? And he did not look like the biggest guy. He looked like he lost weight. I just over yeah. the years, I I yeah. remember because of that specific. Uh, so 2021. So Jacob Paulson also asked that question about when's the last time the five zero line spots being this up in the air. I mean, it was it was it was 2021, really. You know, yeah. that was close to it because it was it was just uh, Patterson that was back. Yeah. That was, um, you know, and he was hurt in the spring. So, mm-hmm. um, but. But that, uh, you know, Carmody, that 2021 year, it was like he was after his first year in the program. And you're like, OK, this guy's got good size. He was competitive. He was like the sixth man. I mean, he came in when when Blake Fisher got hurt against Florida State. And he looked like he was going to be a player. And then I was like, you saw him the next year. You're like, whoa, why is he 280 on listed on the thing? And then you saw him in person. And you're like what's going on with this like he looks skinny like like his i mean his arms should be comparable to my arms <laughs> you know like that shouldn't happen but yeah i don't know where you i don't like this view i'm changing it i'm changing it jamie this didn't work right. what i wanted to do oops that didn't work either all right now we're just a big mess all right let me put it back all right um all right so other things we're monitoring okay so we're looking at we're looking at Luke College. This is a big kind of long time one. We we and I, this has been going on since last year. We're we're all, we're we're keeping an eye on him. Uh, we we loved his measurables. We loved his uh, his athleticism, and and kind of what he brought to the table. He was a walk on and uh, turned down scholarship offers from Pac-12 schools, uh, former Pac-12 schools, I should say. And 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 so you know he came into the program. He has earned a scholarship. And apparently he was do- he's doing some things in in the opening practice, right? Breaking up some passes. So that's something that that's something that um, you know we're going to keep an eye on, right? That's trending in the right direction, I would say. Um, so that's one thing. Deuce Knight is another one. What's the situation with him? Does he actually take a visit to Alabama? He's supposed to come to Notre Dame. He's got a couple visits set up to Notre Dame. That's important. You want to get him back on campus. And look, it's not one of these things where. You know, a lot of people are uh, speaking of monitoring. People monitor the social media activity. I think his social media is good as far as pumping up Notre Dame and tweeting about Notre Dame and things of that nature. Uh, so we're keeping an eye on that. Does he actually visit Alabama? If he does visit Alabama, I think you can start to raise some alarm bells with that. Uh, Michael Bell at, at slot, right? We're monitoring that. He, he fits the profile of someone who – uh, has played slot, right? He's kind of the size of of a Thomas Harper. He's the size of a Jordan Clark, right? And that's slot corner, so people yeah, it's just just so people understand. So they're not not slot on offense. Yeah. Oh yeah. Did I say did yeah. I say slot? 
Uh, well, you just said nickel. slot, so I just wanted to make sure that people weren't getting confused. Yet. Correct, correct. I'm, I'm thinking nickel. Thank you for that, Jamie. I appreciate the, the step in on that. Uh, we're, we're monitoring Chris Mitchell, right? Says he's not a 4-4 guy, 4-3 guy. Can he actually – It does that actually manifest itself on the football field? Can he outrun guys like the Ben Morrisons of the world and, and the Christian Grace, right? Some, some of your top flight corners. Because um, if you're a 4-3 guy, you should be able to get deep on pretty much anyone. Right. So uh, that's something we're going to be monitoring. We mentioned Emil Wagner, uh, Bubakar Traore. Right. I is he taking the next step? Do reports indicate that he's taking the next step? Uh, we're monitoring that. Right. Because I think that's a pretty big deal as far as um, what Notre Dame can be as a pass rushing team. Do they need to play games? Do they need to bring linebackers? And it does. Does it need to be a sub package thing? Or still um, can can. can Bubakar Traore do it just kind of on a four man rush, straight rushes and that sort of thing. Uh, Jacob Paula says low four four is still damn fast. Uh, that, that's true, but he said he, he said I'm not. Don't write I'm four four. He he said it. Don't write that I'm that. So um, so yeah, uh, that's that that's the deal with uh, Chris Mitchell. And then uh, and then I would say just the tackles, right? We mentioned it kind of before, but the, the offensive tackles, we're monitoring that. Where, where is that going? Uh, what are the reports on Tosh Baker? How does he look? Uh, how is he performing against the Bubakar Traores and uh, the, the RJ Obens, guys like that? So uh, anything else on that, Jamie? Um, you know what? I'll just say like uh... – uh, I was just thinking of all of these kind of stuff. So I'm monitoring like a lot of it. So much is O-line, right? Like yeah. monitoring like Ashton Craig. Can Ashton Craig be like the next Jared Patterson? You know, yeah. like is he is is that where his trajectory is? Like I'm I'm monitoring Joe Otting. Is Joe Otting all of a sudden going to be someone? I think he's a super exciting athlete. Can he get into the mix as, as someone early on? Like is he's he, you know, weighed in at 297. He's on the opposite end of the, you know, uh, the, you know, the list in terms of encouraging weight gain and all that, right? Like Sam Pendleton, that's another young guy that I'm monitoring. Like the defensive line, like I think, you know, monitoring like uh, a lot of these young guys in addition to Treyari, right? Like with just, uh, you know, like the Brendan Vernons and um, the Devin Houstons and like, where are these guys going to be at? Because, you know, it sounds like Gabriel Rebo is going to be back in the summer, according to Marcus Freeman. So that's exciting. But, like, uh, you know, are these other guys going to push on Yane Hynish or get on Yane Hynish jump at thing? Like, um, and those young linebackers, right? Like, obviously, we're, like, you know, we're obviously monitoring that position because um, I think the talent there and the ceiling is very high for that position. But you want to see, like, how close they are to that ceiling. Um you know, in spring and in fall. Yeah. Uh, Jacob Paulus is keeping an eye on Jalen Sneed. And is he picking up the will linebacker position? Can he be a full-time guy there or like the starter, you know, uh, counted on to on rundowns and assignments and run fits and things of that nature. So Jacob Paulus is going to keep an eye on that for us. Uh, thank you, Jacob. He's a, he's a long time, uh, you know, viewer of this show participates all the time so thank you for that xr nd 1994 says once pads are on for spring practice what do you hope to be hearing about uh the offense and defense i think we've kind of heard that a little bit or i'm mean, not heard we've we've talked about that a little bit just in the last question but i do want to hear some consistently good things from the wide receivers right i, I it's one thing to have a good practice or whatever we're getting deep all the time it's another thing to um kind of be doing it over and over again and it, i'd like it to be kind of the same person right I, i'd like it to be like hey we're seeing consistently good play i don't care who it is either a, a consistently good play from chris mitchell consistently good play from Jaden greathouse or, or Jaden thomas um things of that nature right I'd, li I'd like that's something i'd like to hear about obviously the o-line i feel like that goes on to like everything from the spring it's like hearing good things about the whole line. Um, but where are you at with this question, Jamie? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, like you said, the receivers, I, I think specifically, I know we talked about like the need for tackles, but like I want to hear that the guards are like hanging in there with like Mills and Cross and, mm. and the defensive tackles. Like that these guys are like competing at that level where you're like, man, these guys have, you're, they're excited 
about how, how they how they're uh, competing there with them. I think that is a big thing, and I, I think everybody wants to hear about like just young guys, right? Because mm. there's always going to be guys that, um, you know, everyone has expectations for certain guys to take a jump or guys who are turning, like you know, so like you know, last year like X Watts. There was an ex, even though I mean, no one expected him to be an All American, but there was an expectation he was going to be like a good starter. Like he was, he was ready to take that leap to become like a really good starter. And then obviously he did that and more. But I like to hear about the guys that, you know, you didn't expect a lot from, right? Like you, you weren't kind of expecting a lot from. So, like, I don't know, just throwing just in there. Ben Minich, all of a sudden you're like, man, Ben Minich is like a baller. Like he's just out, like something like that, where you're just like, you're just hearing about somebody that you're like, this guy just took a jump because that happens all the time. And that's, and that's always a good thing. And I, I think that there's a lot of guys uh, out of the young group of, of players that are going into that, uh, their second or th third year at Notre Dame, like, those are the guys I want to hear it about, right? Where you're just those unexpected guys, because that's always something. Because it, it all of a sudden it can change the trajectory of your team when when yeah. all of a sudden it's like the guys you don't expect become like really really good. Um, love this comment from Brandon Renshaw. Uh, big year for the young interior D line. Vernon Ford, Houston need to take the next step and push Heinish and Anya Mills and Cross can't stay forever. Uh, I think that's a great call, right? Like I think. You take those two guys for granted and you expect them to be the workhorses inside. And, and I think there's good reason to expect it, right? Uh, they're, they're obviously good players. But the, Notre Dame does need to have depth there and they need to be able to turn over the, the roster a bit at that spot. So, like, hearing good things from Brandon Vernon, uh, hearing good things from Tyson Ford or Devin Houston, like, that's important. They do need those guys to step up, especially if, you know, you talked a little bit about Gabriel Rubio in your Thursday thoughts as well. Like, he's... I don't want to say scheduled to come back. I think it's possible he can come back. So that's something to something to monitor right there. Like some continued progress in that, in that sense. But um, we, hearing from the young D lineman would be very important because, you know, you start thinking of beyond 2025 or beyond 2024 into 25, 26, those guys are going to be a big part of um, kind of Notre Dame situation there. So that's a good, that's a good shout from uh, Brandon Renshaw to use a British uh, phrase. Uh, Vamos Irish. Here we go. Oscar. He, he, go. He, was, he was waiting for it. Yeah. Uh, let, let's, let's, let's give this the full, the full send. St. Patrick venerates the patron saint of Ireland, a man credited with converting the country to Christianity by associating the shamrocks, three leaves with the Holy Trinity. The power of three lives at Notre Dame, where the third year is the make or break year for a head coach. What three major events need to work in Notre Dame's favor for them to win a natty this year? Uh, events can be Notre Dame outscores teams by 30 points on average in the regular season, to Georgia is forced to sit their starters for a cheating allegation, to Notre Dame commits zero penalties or turnovers in the playoffs. So why don't you why don't you give one and I'll give I'll give a second one. And okay, we'll so on. like specific events and not something like, you know, the receivers become great or like it's more like specific events, I guess, like individual events. Um, I, okay, I would say mostly full health at the end of the regular season. Mm -hmm. Like no major injuries to key players at, at – at um at the time of the when they're going into the playoff i think that is is you know going into that that's like very luck of the irish like they need that they absolutely need that because they can't it, they, they just i just don't see the team being built in a way that they can withstand that if they have um like a major major injury to someone who's like I, whatever. I don't even want to name the guys to jinx it, but you know what I mean. Right. I got you. Um, for me, I, CFB Hertz is kind of uh, on track with this, where my thinking. Uh, Notre Dame makes a statement in College Station. They need to be a great road team. Uh, they need to be a very, very good road team this year. They were obviously a very bad road team last year. Um, some of their worst performances were on the road, right? In, in games where, obviously, they played tougher teams, but 
you, you just don't need to be laying an egg like that. Like you don't need to lay an egg in Louisville. You don't need, I, in, in my opinion, you kind of laid an egg offensively against Clemson, right? You had, you had a couple good drives there, but really like it just wasn't a good performance. And, and I just don't think you need to see that. Right. And so I, if you're going to go win a national title, right. You got to be able to play away from your stadium and you got to be a great road team. And, and, and that goes along with making a statement in college station. Yeah. But like, you got to play well, you got to be able to be the team that you want to be when you're not in South bend. And I think that's been, that was a problem for them last year. And look, if you're, if you're going to be a national title team, like you got to be like, those types of teams are dominant, whether they're home or away. And I think you got to be able to do that. Uh, what, 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 go ahead. I was going to say that kind of built into one other one. I was going to say beat the brakes off of USC in, in Los Angeles because that was, yeah. I think, you know, like going there and I mean, not to say like, you know, the last times that Notre Dame, uh, when they were able to, you know, 2012 and, and 2018, when they had those games to close out there, I mean, you win those games. It's, it's obviously, it's a win's a win. Like, you know, you want to get out of there, but it wasn't exactly like going into those games and winning those games that way. It didn't instill confidence that they were going to be like, man, this is a national championship team. So go there, beat the brakes off of USC, who hopefully is like kind of beat up from playing a really tough schedule. Yeah. And that's a, it, like on the road, you go out there and, you know, you win convincingly in the game like that. That's the kind of thing too, where all of a sudden it, it, it kind of leads into another thing. Like you have to have someone like Riley Leonard or somebody on the offense, got to be like a Heisman content, like someone like this guy is an elite guy. Like yeah, one of the best guys in college football where you're like, and when you have like a statement kind of win like that, that's where it kind of leads into. Yeah. Um, I think that's a hundred percent right. I, so, and that's why I, I highlighted the road aspect of this. Cause look, like, you know, um, CFB Hertz says USC is going to be limping to the finish line after their schedule this year. In 2012, USC was limping to the finish line in 2018. USC was limping to those were bad football teams that USC put out there against undefeated Notre Dame teams. And those were games that Notre Dame had to survive. I talked about this a bunch. When was the last time? Thank you, Joe bro for hitting the thumbs up. Really appreciate that. Um, when was the last time Notre Dame like went to USC and like you said, beat the doors off them? 2000. Like that was yeah, 38, yeah. 21. I mean, that was a long time ago. You beat them by multiple touchdowns. You beat them by three plus. Gosh, touchdowns. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. It just doesn't happen. Right. It, it, it just, you just don't Notre Dame does not go to LA and pound on USC. Like a, a 48 to 20 whooped them at win, home a bunch. Whooped them at home a bunch. Right. Uh, 48 to 20 win like that. Like just whatever happened. Like if you were, if they were to do that, that would just be, uh, to me, a huge sign. This year is different. This yeah. team is different, right? Uh, so that's that's a good call. On, also on the starts USC. rumblings for the Lincoln Riley. Like it's just, it's it would be all good for Notre Dame. Here, here, yeah. here. Hot take Thursday uh, contribution. Okay, this is Lincoln Riley's last year at USC. Ooh, okay. No matter what, it's yeah. his last year at USC. That's I'm calling it. I've heard enough things just uh, th that kind of add up to that. Just to kind of add, you know, I, I, I think it's going to be his last year. I think the, that whole operation is tired of college. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Not built for it is where I'm coming with it. But we'll see. Uh, Iris Bronx, how can you possibly consider Miss Terry anything but cringeworthy? Here's the thing. I'm a big, like, honor your wife. Honor your woman. Yeah, honor, and, if yeah. th and if that's how... If that's how he does it, it's not something I would do, but that's yeah. him. And he's from the South. And it's like, Miss Terry, like, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate the, the the reverence that goes along with that. That That's where I'm at with it. That's cringe. It's not cringeworthy to me. Do you have anything I, to say you've kind of mentioned? Not this? cringeworthy, but I just, I still, man, I just, somebody. Do you call man, her Miss Terry around Do you the house? call Miss Terry to her face? Do you say, uh, oh, Miss Terry, I'm home. You know, like. Uh, hey, Miss Terry, can you grab me a Coke? 
Like, just I want to know. I want to know. Someone needs to. Someone needs to say. Uh, I need. To, I need to find out. It's funny. So, like for me, I I call Amy mom around the kids, which I think is pretty normal. I think that's normal, right? Like, so if the kids are around, I will say, "Hey, mom, like, what 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 are we doing later?" Yeah, or my wife, mama, around my yeah. Son. Hey, mom, like, uh, you know, the 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 baby needs the bath or something, like something like that. Yeah. Like, I, I I do call her mom around the kids, like to her face. I mean, we have our little pet names that I won't embarrass myself with. Uh, on on this show but like it, it, i don't i don't call her miss amy that's certainly true i don't do that um but you know everyone has their own thing and i and i appreciate that uh all right next question from sloth with the team on spring break what is your favorite spring break memory from your formative years any fun vacations <laughs> you go oh man spring break i i don't really have a lot of like big spring break memories because like spring break for me like when I was in school, like in, in university, I, I never went like, oh yeah, we're going down to Florida or we're, right. you know, we're going to Mexico or whatever, Cancun, right. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I never did any of that. So it was more like, um, staying around and just partying. Like it was like kind of nor just very normal stuff or going back home. And, you know, meeting with friends or whatever, like, so I just, I don't have like a lot of like crazy spring break memories. And also like my birthday is always like around spring break time. So it's mm. like, it just is, you know, it all kind of is in there together. So yeah, I don't know. I don't have any, I don't, I don't. Yeah. Um, so it, it, later in high school and in my first couple years in college, I was running track. So that's obviously in spring. You're not going anywhere for that. Uh, but the year that I I joined the the um, junior college football team, uh, we had spring off, right? So me, two, me and two of my friends decided it would be great fun. So we're in California now. It took a great fun to drive to Florida. <laughs> so we were like 20. This is a 2001, right? So spring of 2001. So uh, I would have been 20 at the time. Well, actually, 19 actually, because it wouldn't have been my birthday yet. So we drove to Florida. Okay. Uh, that trip is like the most amazing thing I've ever done. Uh, it's amazing. I lived through it, to be honest, like just like, looking back on it, all the things that happened. I mean, you're talking about three 19 year olds driving across. Like we were using an old kind of car that someone just kind of got for us. Um, yeah. Cali to Florida is what it was. The, fun fact, you can take the 10. You could take 10 east all the way all you don't have to get on any other interstate just take 10 east it goes all the way to florida uh and so on 10 east is tallahassee right you can exit uh tallahassee florida from the 10 east so that was what we did we were all playing college football at the time our junior college football so we, we uh texas is jason smith texas is insane texas is nuts like it's it, so big it, i don't i and I had the shift where it was like basically midnight to six. So what we would do is we would drive in shifts. You drove until you ran out of gas and you would fill up. And then the next person would shift over and you would drive until you ran out of gas, basically. So that's how it went. Anyway, exit Tallahassee, drove to Florida State, and we we, we parked the car outside Doke, Doke Campbell, right? Walk up to Doke Campbell. Gates are just open. Okay, walk on the field of Dope Campbell Stadium. Like we're standing on the field, we're taking pictures on the field. Uh, no one's there, right? No one cares. And so we're just like walking around the whole stadium. Go into the basically the, the players like lounge slash locker room. And my friend was like, I'm gonna go find Bobby Bowden and I'm gonna tell him to recruit me, right? So he walks up these stairs and enters a door. And, and he's like, where is he going? Like, it's just like trespassing, but it's like, he's, he's, he's entering doors that are open. So he's not breaking in, but it's like, it's probably trespassing. So we're sitting there and, and we're standing there and we can see doors like th through the way. And it, it's like, says like Florida state locker room. So we're standing there and like all their national title trophies are there. 
and and uh, all their uh, Heisman's are there, things of that nature. And remember, this is 2001. Florida State was a huge thing at the time, right? So he pops his head through the the doors to the locker room, and he says, "Come on!" So he takes it. So we go into the locker room. We're walking around the Florida State locker room. No one is around. There's all these shoes. There's all this gear. There's all this stuff. We didn't take anything. Uh, free shoes university. You should have. I, I should have. I totally should have. <laughs> so there's all this stuff walking around the locker room, like all the name plates are on there. Walk through the whole facility. Um, and you know, we see all their, their meeting rooms, all where they watch film. It, it was just a whole, a whole thing. And it's like, so that's, that was all we did. So that's my craziest like spring break, uh, story of something that I did. Um, Okay, I just want to add a couple things. First of all, that's that's a great story. Uh, one, okay, now that just reminded me of the free shoes thing. I remember, remember the days when it was a scandal that some guy at Foot Locker was given free shoes to Florida State yeah. players. Like, yeah. How in clean. hindsight, not not really that a big, not not that big of a deal. You know, maybe didn't deserve a Sports Illustrated cover. Um, you know, pro- probably not that big of a deal. Uh, also because Brandon Renshaw made the joke about igloos, I just want to point out that I grew up, you know, near Vancouver, BC. Uh, it's, I, I think, you know, I know he was just joking, but like, I think there's a lot of people who still have an idea that think that like, uh, Canada is like the Arctic, uh, <laughs> and definitely like Vancouver is not. And I just want to say that like, Spring break in Vancouver, BC, a good place to visit. A mm. really good place to visit. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, it's beautiful all year, but it's like pretty like mild, but like you know, usually sunny. Sometimes you get the rain because obviously yeah. it's a place that rains a lot. But it, it's pr- it's pretty nice. It's like I mean, there's a lot of like outdoor stuff. It's a beautiful city, obviously, right by the you know the water and all that too. Mm. Great place to visit for, for spring break. There you go. Get on it. Vancouver. Uh, it's it's fun. Uh, we went there in um, my family. We went there in 2016 on October. Amy was pregnant with Wesley. And uh, and then we, we only had our, our oldest at that point. We only had two kids. So or they only had one kid. She was pregnant. So it was a good time. We had, we had a lot of fun. Um, okay. Next question. Uh, Sloth again. Thank you, Sloth. As a fan of an NFL team in need of a quarterback, how would you guys rank the top six quarterbacks in the NFL draft in terms of most likely to succeed? So Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, and JJ McCarthy. I mean, I would just Caleb Williams. Like, I just don't even think it's a debate. Do you think do you think he's like good? Yes. I think mm. he's great. Okay. I think he's great. Anyone who's just like be like, well, Notre Dame shut him down. I mean, the kid, like he had nowhere to go the whole game. Like he was harassed the whole game. And even if you look at like how they lost this year, he balled out in a lot of those games. Yeah. Like, and he wasn't as good as he was the previous season, but he was still great. And the previous season, he you know his Heisman year, that was as good as anybody. Like, put that up with, like, the best individual, you know, the Lamar Jackson Heisman year, the, like, you know, RG3, like, um, I'm, you know, Tebow. I, I know Tebow's year. He was incredible. Like, you know, just whatever. Pick any quarterback that you're, you're thinking of in terms of their Heisman year and how good it was. Caleb Williams was as good as anyone. And I just, I mean, I think he's – He's spectacular. Like you could hate on him because he's from, you know, went to USC and, you know, he's got the fingernails or whatever, but like, are you kidding? If he, like, if he played for Notre Dame, the guy would be a legend. People would just love him. Right. Like he, yeah. because he is just a phenomenal talent. Right. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like I, to me, like, I mean, a lot of these guys could end up being good. You know, chances are what will probably happen is three of them will probably be good. Yeah. The other three won't. Right. Like that's and a lot of it depends on where they go and where they get drafted. Right. Just like how Bryce Young, it might be better for him this year, but he walked into a bad situation in Carolina 
And CJ Stroud was better than him, but he also walked into a better situation with the Texans. So that kind of stuff matters too. But I just think like Caleb Williams is the kind of guy that, I mean, even with USC, like I think you could argue that USC this year, if they didn't have Caleb Williams, they probably wouldn't have made a bowl game. Like their, their defense is horrible again. They're, you know, the O line was bad. They didn't have the receivers were good, but like not the same level as they were the year before. So I, I don't know. I, I just, I have a hard time believing that any of those other guys like um, that I would bet on any of those other guys. Like I could Jaden Daniels be the best of the, yeah, for sure. Right. Like could Drake make, yeah, sure. Even JJ McCarthy in the right spot. If he goes to the right spot, I think, you know, you're like, okay, yeah, he's got talent. Like, but I still think if I was going to bet on any of them, I would, I mean, Caleb Williams, like, I don't even think it's close for me. Um, I think that, I think Caleb Williams Drake may and McCarthy will be good. And the reason I think McCarthy will be good is I think that a team that is good and has a good uh, situation will draft him and they won't make him play early. Uh, And that's been like a, like a great thing for like a lot of like uh, Mahomes. Like he sat behind Alex Smith for a bit. Um, What's his name? uh jordan love for the packers like he he got to sit aaron Rodgers got to sit right like i think there's something to to be clear about um that um chief brody's chief yeah mahomes yeah chief brody's talking about cj stroud he is great he is he's very good i think i think when you saw what he did against georgia in the bowl game i think that was like okay like this guy's legit uh, just he in was terms great of, in, the, the, in that Notre Dame game too. They don't was, win without him, right? He was. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, so he's he's good. I, I think I think Jaden Daniels, of all of them, I just think he's too small. I like the thousand yards rushing stuff. It, it, it's almost like it doesn't matter as an NFL player. Like, yeah, he's a good scrambler, and that's good, right? I just think he's 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 too small. He's too slight. I, I just think he's physically going to get beat up in the pros. I think Michael Penix and Bo Nix were kind of products of uh, college offenses that aren't really replicable in the NFL. Bo Nix I have the least confidence in. Yeah. Plus he was like 25 or whatever. Like, yeah. it's just, you know, and he's playing in, in Oregon system, it, which is fine. I'm, I'm not hating on him. I just don't think it's going to translate. And, and, and I've talked about McCarthy. So I would say Williams, May, McCarthy, uh, probably Daniels, then Penix, Knicks last. That's what I would say. Uh, next question, Sloth. Last one from Sloth. In the recent Dom Hulock article, his high school coach, Matt Bowen, talked about how the Olympic lifting is what uh, best directly translates to actions on the football field. Given how sometimes coaches want uh, in-person evaluations for timing of skilled players and running the 40, are there instances where a recruiting staff requests an O-line, D-line guy at camp do an uh, in-person Olympic lift to verify whatever numbers they are reporting? Or is that asking too much of a prospect to try to max rep in a camp environment? First of all, it's a great question. I love this kind of question because it's yeah. like kind of thinking like really granular. I love it. Great question, Sloth. Um, I think that, yes, it is asking too much to bring in some guy who's to do a max rep at a camp. Like, yeah. at a, you know, because you don't know where that person is, the training. The other thing is, is that some of these guys have never done Olympic lifts. There's a lot of guys that come to Notre Dame, come to LSU, Alabama, whatever, even like it just, they haven't done Olympic lifts. So Hulak is lucky that he is at a program where they have a staff that, you know, teaches them how to, I mean, he's got good technique, like really good technique. I don't know. People should check out the article. I, I, uh, posted a link in there of him doing, um, you know, hand cleans in there. And like, Mm -hmm. he's pushing weight, man. Like, and it's good technique. Like, um, so I think it is, it's like kind of like a tool. If you, if they have that, if they have clips of them, you know, working out and doing that weight and they have like, they're able to verify them doing these kind of lifts and getting that, I think that is like a valuable piece to an evaluation if you if you can have that they're already doing this and they're 
because that means there's less for them to catch up when they get into Notre Dame. So I think that is, it, it can be a good thing, but I'm always wary of like judging too much um, of that when you're um, looking at someone because of like, you don't know their lack of experience with it. Uh, yeah. And especially like in, and, and, any kind of like weight kind of stuff too. It's just like, you don't know their lack of experience. You don't know if like these guys are just coming off of like basketball or track. So maybe they haven't been lifting the same mm -hmm. way during that time uh, because some of these other guys are doing multiple sports, like, which is, that's the part that's crazy with Hulak because he's playing these sports and still able to kind of work out the way he, he is because a lot of times that takes away from people training and doing that extra stuff. But um Context is always matters with this kind of stuff in terms of like, yeah. uh, you know, what, what they've done before. And I would say even, you, you know, too, Greg, with like the 40, if a guy's run track, if a guy, if a guy's a track guy and then he runs a bad 40, I'm wary of that. Cause mm -hmm. I'm like you as a sprinter, like if you're a sprinter mm -hmm. in track and, and you run a bad 40 time, like in camp or something like that. And I'm like, this guy's like, then I'm like, okay, like that is because this guy's been training. He's, he's been taught he, or he should have been taught how to like run properly. Right. And right. Um, not a lot of guys are. So that's if, if some guy might run like a poor 40, but I'm like, okay, this guy's never run. He's never done this. He's never done that. Right. That kind of stuff kind of matters to me. So context is always important. Yeah. Like I always look at the number of, like times a guy has so like i think a good example of this is like kevin austin like he had some like high 10 900 times whatever but then you go look at like his his like because they track this stuff right so you look at his thing he has like one 100 a year it's like well that's not how it works like you don't you know like first of all you got to train to run 100 like you do people just don't like go out there and run 100 meter races like it's it's an endurance race is as much as it is a speed race right you do have to prepare for that stuff. So like to, to your point, context is important. And I also think with Olympic lifts and how much you're lifting is like, there's no clear, uh, I, I guess, benchmark for, or like, a, like in the 40, a four or five is a four, you know, a four or five, like, you know what that means, right? Like there could be a barrier to entry there, but like, it's like, oh, I need this guy to power clean X weight at this, height and weight like i don't think it matters like that maybe it does maybe it does for strength guys but i i just don't think uh i just i just don't think that there's that kind of carryover there right so um oh go ahead well i was gonna say that one thing too that i think uh is important and also to why camp is important in, in period because when you get to see guys and you you know obviously when they're getting um Notre Dame and these schools are getting testing numbers from, uh, you know, camps, right. Which are verified. And they, you know, a lot of these things are like, those are legit camps. So I get it. They're getting good numbers there. But one of the reasons why it's important for them to get, you know, some guys to get them on campus and get them, uh, test them on their own mm. and get these measurements on their own is because you just know what's reliable to you. And like what works for you, just why, why these at the combine, we get the times that it's like, you know, what's his face ran a four, two, whatever. Right. And you're yeah. like, whatever. Well, the teams all have scouts. Why do you, why are they like, Oh, they already have the official times. Why do they have, well, why do they do it? Cause they want to get their testing. Cause that scout is going to that guy's pro day. Yeah. And he is going to time him there. So, you know, it's consistent. Right? right. So that's the same thing. Right. So it's just all that kind of level of consistency. That's the other kind of stuff that's like doesn't get kind of talked about enough about terms of like all this kind of how this kind of matters into it. And like um, and even with the rankings. Right. Where it's like I don't I, I think there's a lot of numbers that we that we get and we hear about like this guy ran this or he measured in or whatever that he, if they didn't go to a UC report camp, then maybe the, uh, or, or some other kind of camp or whatever, they didn't go to the, the army combine or whatever it is. Yeah. If they didn't go there, 
then 247 didn't get the same numbers. You know what I mean? So it's like, well, that affects their ranking and all like so mm-hmm. there's all of these kind of pieces under anyways. This I'm getting too way too nerdy with it, but um, anyways, this is a great question, Sloss. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a good Go question. Off. And it's good that um like like you mentioned the the like his technique and how he does, right? Like I think that's super important too. Like there was there's such a big like just no, a lot of guys don't know how to do Olympic lifts. I, me, me being one of them, like that was a big hindrance for me. It's like you're never really taught this stuff. Like you do want to get the expertise, right? Like it's not something that you can just do, right? Like you need to be taught like the proper tech. It's like sprinting. It's like anything else. You do need to learn that stuff. So I think the fact that he's been taught this, and I, I just think and the other part too is like he's taken to it. Like you said, he's a multiple sport athlete. And so he's kind of added um, this to his like his toolbox or whatever, and being able to to be a lifter in this way, like I think that's a huge, um, it's a huge it's a huge thing for him. It's a huge notch in his belt yeah. that he has this um, in his background. Um, and and you like you want to you want to uh, maximize things, right? Like you always want to maximize your ability um, as as a, as a lifter, Jamie. And also, or your website or your social media page, you want to maximize these things. You want to bring in people from the outside to teach you how to do those things. Photos, videos, whatever it may be. And you can do that for your website, your social media page, whatever it might be, with vsrmediacompany.com, founded by Notre Dame football pregame host and Emmy Award-winning anchor, Vahid Saad Razadeh. VSR Media provides professional and cinematic video and photo. Whether you're looking for a collegiate or pro-level highlight reel, have a personal story to tell, or are aiming to diversify and grow your business, VSR Media specializes in short and long-form video storytelling, social media management, and website design. VSR Media also captures professional headshots, senior, and sports photos. Contact them at vsrmediacompany.com. Mention Iris Sports Daily to receive 20% off your first project. Visit them online or give them a call at 574-800-9106. All right, a couple more questions here. Rajon's going to be excited about that one. Rajon's going to be fired up. That was, that was a good one. Um, uh, let's see. Hi, Greg. Would you consider doing a men's basketball podcast similar to Dines with Dara? Who would be the first three alumni you would call to co-host with you? Um I think what's most likely and what will probably is going to happen is Dara and I will just cover the men a lot more in depth than we did this year, basically. Um, with this being our first year doing uh, basketball, we just wanted to focus on the women. And uh, going forward into next year, we'll, we'll probably just cover both teams. Uh, I think everyone's excited about it. Uh, Jason Smith, uh, thank you for the nice words. Dara there is a great creation. Yeah, and I think we, we – we, we started it up. We both love doing it. So we'll just, we'll just keep it going. We'll cover both the men and the women next year. Um, you know, bring, bring it, bring it a lot to the Irish sports uh, YouTube channel. So we're very excited about that. So thank you everyone for your viewership on that. That's why you want to subscribe. Irish sports You get all the dimes with Dara, uh, podcasts. Uh, all right. Our last question here, which is actually three questions. Who is Notre Dame's next 1000 yard wide receiver? Will it come in 2024? What do you think, Jamie? I'm going to guess no, not this year. I guess so. I, I think they'll, maybe they'll have someone close, and my guess would be Chris Mitchell would be. He's the leader in the clubhouse right now to, for me to be the leader receiver. I just think just in terms of um, I think he's he's, you know, got the most kind of big play potential. Um my guess is that their next uh, thousand yard receiver is going to be Jaden Greathouse in 2025. That is going to be my guess. Mm, interesting. Um, I agree with you. I think there's too many. I think there's too many good options, and without one like Will Fuller type or a Chase Claypool type, that's kind of what you need in the Notre Dame offense. Um, like Will Fuller was the only one. Uh, from like the Denbrock years, right? He 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 did it in 14, he did it in 15. Uh EQ did not do it in 16. Uh I, did TJ Jones in 13? I I think he, he did. Right? I think he did, he did as well. Yeah, but I don't think they have anyone who's like TJ Jones. Sneakily, 
like one of the great single season doesn't get talked about enough. I mean, like, like the Daniels Jones combo in 13, like that's a sneaky good, fantastic, sneaky good combo. Yeah, yeah. They, they were very good. I don't think it's coming in, uh, in, in 24. I, I, I like, I like the great house shop. I think that, I think that's really good. Uh, assuming he is the starter. Over under on Leonard's rushing yards, his career high is 699. Jaden Daniels went over 1,000 yards last year. I'm on record as saying he's going to go over 100. Uh, but I'll set the over under at 900.5. So you're going over under that. I'm going to go I'm under, going but I'm going to guess But I'm going to guess it's going to be in the 800s. I think it's gonna so be I, Wimbush, I, I just – sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say Wimbush, just as for context, I think he was 803 in 2017. I think that's what um, the reason why I'm going lower is because one, I think the schedule sets up where they're going to have a lot of blowouts. So he's not, there's mm. going to be some games where he's not, you know, he's going to have like, I think he's going to have like a few hundred yard games. Like, you know, yeah. like that's going to happen. But I also think there might be games where it's like, he's got 30 and it's like, they didn't run him very much in this game. That's, like they didn't have to. That's a good call. That's, that's a good one. Uh, okay, three. Over, under on Leonard's completion percentage. Last year, he was 58%. In two years with Denbrock, Daniels was at 68% and then 72%, both career highs. I think I think he's going to be over 58%. Um, he's going to be, I want to say, 60, 63% next year. That's where I think he'll be at. I was going to say like 63, 64. I think that was, I'm guessing, around there. Yeah. I just think I I just think there's going to be enough easy throws in the offense to get it there, right? A lot yeah. of RPO stuff. I, I think he'll get there fairly easily. Um, or which guard is more likely to improve as a pass blocker, Coogan or Rocco? This is a good question. This is a great question, and I was thinking about this one, and I'm going to say Coogan because I think if you look at who was a better overall pass blocker in most games? You would say Coogan. Because it's just that in the games where he was overmatched by somebody, Coogan was, I mean, when he was overmatched, it was like, <laughs> it's a wrap. Like that was, and he struggled those, those whole games, right? Like, um, but when, you know, the rest of the time he was very solid. And um, I think with, with Rocco, it was more of like, while he didn't have a uh, as many of like the, wow, he gave up like eight pressures in this game kind of thing. He just was less consistent overall. Uh, and I think part of it too is like, he's just a guy that Coogan is a little bit better athletically than, than, than Rocco. So from that perspective, I, I would say Coogan, but I would say that's another reason too, why both of these guys – it's not a sure thing with them to me that they're going to win either of those jobs because I think, you know, Shrouth is a better athlete than both of them. And um, I, I mean, we'll see with some of the other guys in terms of their athleticism and how they hold up. But like it is, I, I still have, I just have questions about both of them. So I don't, I just don't know. Um, I, I can't really recall someone like really being like, Man, I, I, they weren't good, and then they got to really good as like a in pass pro. When guys were in their third year, it's not like they were first year guys. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm skeptical. So, uh, you know, I always you know think of that principal Skinner. Prove me wrong, children. Prove me wrong. Like just, I, I, I hope they prove me wrong. But I'm just I'm very skeptical of both those guys right now in terms of how they can hang in pass pro. Where would you put Shrouth in this? Shrouth, I mean, I think one of the reasons why Shrouth didn't win the job was because he was like, I mean, it was just evident that he really struggled to anchor against right. Bull Rush. And I was like, wow. But then I'll say when he stepped in the last few games, to be fair, he didn't get, he didn't have to play against, you know, Peter Woods and Tyler Davis and Clemson. Like he didn't have those kind of situations. So he didn't have those same level of guys that he was going against in, in his last few weeks, but I thought he did a pretty good job. And um, I just, I would put, 
I'm more optimistic about his improvement than I am about their improvement because of his tools. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Just wanted to, uh, to get that on the record. Uh, and that's going to do it for today's mailbag show. That's, that's good stuff. I, I enjoyed that. Thank you for all the questions from everyone on irisportsdaily.com. Thank you for everyone in the chat. Hi, Jimmy page. We're wrapping up the show. Hopefully you're able to catch it. Uh, and if not, then you can go back and listen to it again. And, and anyone else who hasn't, uh, Hasn't been able to watch, so you can watch it on replay as well. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Once again, hit the like, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, so whenever it is, we are going live. We'll be back next week talking more Notre Dame football. Have a good weekend, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Keep hitting and hustling. Hey, Rajon.